Green. Hello, everybody. Welcome for joining. But I'll give you an opportunity to introduce yourself. Or I guess, Brad, you're going to kind of take this over, aren't you? Yeah, if that's it's okay. So good. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it's so good this way. Yeah. 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 Love it. Mandy, if you just if you want to start off, that's great. Yeah. Well, well, do you want to give a few minutes? We usually to give a couple yeah. minutes for people yeah. to log in and no problem. Joanne, if you want to give an intro about what we have going on, I've been out of the country, everybody. I had an opportunity to go to Costa Rica and present at an event and meet some awesome connections. Um, lots of opportunity there. <laughs> lots of, you know, I got to meet like big co-ops and cattle farmers and um yeah, big, big farm, like sugar cane and bananas and pineapple. And it, it's just really awesome. The, and the need really for the rotation crop doesn't change there. There's a lot of need for, you know, genetics and processing. And yeah, it was really exciting to do some education. So I've been out, um, but Joanne, she's been hard at work getting ready for NOCO. For those of you that are going to NOCO, I'd love to connect with you. I know Joanne said we may have some time that We've got some stuff going on. I don't know what events for sure. Wednesday night, we've got something. There's a mixer. And then our advisors. Bob, you're not coming down to NOCO by chance, are you? No, I'm not. Okay. okay. Well, shoot. I was hoping to see you too. Um, <laughs> yeah, we're going to do our, our advisor meeting then. And then there's a mixer. And then on Thursday night is our awards banquet. I know for those of you, um, Joanne sent out an email um, to nominate, to let everybody know who's been nominated. <laughs> So that's been pretty fun. We had over 400 nominations. Uh, some of the sound was. Was... Oh, there we go. Um, <laughs> and then anyways, go ahead, Joanne, and then we'll hand it over to Brad. Yeah, um, so like Mandy said, um, there was some emails that went out about nominations. The nominations closed yesterday. So everybody who submitted, thank you so much. And uh, we're gonna be notifying the finalists um, sometime today or tomorrow as well. So uh, again, thank you everybody for your participation. But if you'd like to continue that participation, feel free to join us at the awards banquet. Um, if you'll be at NOCO, like Mandy said, that will be on the 24th, which is Thursday night. It'll be a great sit down dinner, uh, three course meal with drinks um, and lots of good company and get to honor those in the uh, industry that were recognized by their peers. So we're looking forward to that dinner. And if you're gonna be at NOCO, make sure to stop at our booth, booth number 602. We're gonna have lots of cool stuff. Um, if you're a member, definitely stop by. If you wanna talk about membership or possibly join, stop by for sure too. We got a lot of stuff that we're gonna be um, talking about and have uh, available. So make sure you stop by and say hi. And like I always mention, if you wanna talk about membership on a Zoom call, or if you wanna just connect, if you are a member and talk about benefits, you can uh, email me or schedule with my Calendly and I would be happy to meet with you. And stop by our booth for a chance to enter to win a tiny home. Yes. So we're doing a game, you pull so many cards and if you pull GHA or H or hemp, spell hemp, then you win a tiny home. And so that'll be fun too. Anyways. I'm excited about this, Brad. Brad and I were just saying today's a small group. We, there's a, a North Carolina Hemp Expo going on and they got incredible turnout. And so I'm really excited about that for them. Um, and so unfortunately we had this plan and it's planned every month. I like it though, because they are reshared and being viewed. And so that works out really well, but we've got a great guest. Brad does a great job on these and we are hosting them every Wednesday. And so, yes, Brad, I just, here we are again. <laughs> Thank you, Mandy. Yeah. Um, yeah. First of all, I want a tiny a tiny home. How do I do that? I I need to register from afar. Wow. A tiny yeah. home. Yeah. That's really cool. And um, it's, been, it's been fun putting it together because we've gotten a bunch of like somebody that builds tiny homes regularly and has a number of orders right. ready. We've been able to connect them with builders that are now, yeah, we can or not builders, but suppliers of like the floor, the insulation, the building materials. To right, work. right. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure who would live in the tiny home, either myself or I might make my two dogs who won't shut up to the, this morning live in the tiny house. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm apologizing again for those that just joined in case you hear dogs barking in the background today. My two are being a little bit feisty. Um, anyway, uh, Mandy, thank you for letting us come on and do this. 
Um, I, I do feel like we've got a great um, session today. And so I kind of want to get directly into it. Um, so again, my name is Brad Roth. I am with Cannabis News Hub. And um, we are, in fact, uh, partners with the Global Hemp Association. Um, we are an industry resource and we deliver information, research, news, and data uh, to help people keep up with everything that's happening in this industry. Um, we partner with GHA and we help in a variety of ways. This is one of the things that we do. We have this monthly seminar where we bring in folks who are industry experts in a variety of things, and they'll talk about their knowledge and how they can possibly um, answer questions and be of assistance uh, to members of GHA. Um, so uh, re really quickly, what is Cannabis News Hub? Uh, I won't spend too long on this. We take um, information and we aggregate it on a database. Uh, it's about news coverage, information, research, and data. It helps people in the industry stay on top of things, whether it's trends, events, people driving the change and the innovation across the industry. Um, it's also very customizable. So you don't have to read 10,000 articles a day, uh, ultimately to keep, keep um, in touch with what's happening. You actually can create alerts on subject areas that matter to you, and then the system will actually email you information as you need it. Um, one of the things that we hear from people all the time is that, you know, it's tough to keep up with everything. There's too many email, uh, emails to read. There's too many blogs to read. I can't keep track of it all. There's too, many, too much information, too many sources, you know, which ones ultimately are legitimate, so forth and so on. Um, and really what we do on the right-hand side is it's comprehensive, it's aggregated, I think most people have figured out that really the strength of what we do is it's hyper local information to very broad global information. Um, we can get down into the county seats of your areas and regions and bring that kind of information to bear. Um, so uh, with that being said, let's get to the good stuff. Um, and this is the good stuff. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce everyone today to Juliana Whitney. Um, Juliana is the CEO and founder of a company called Can Strategy. Um, she has specialized in new venture creation and development and has been focused on the cannabis industry for a while. And, and I think um, she's going to kind of walk through a, a variety of things for us today. Um, one thing I do want to mention, uh, you all were terrific at this uh, in our last session that we did. Um, if you go ahead and just put questions in the, in the chat, um, I will monitor the chat and we'll come back to it uh, at various points in Juliana's presentation and conversation. Um, so uh, please don't hesitate to do that. Um, but again, I, I'm not going to read these bullet points per se. I'm going to let Juliana introduce herself. Um, but coming to us from Las Vegas today is Juliana. And again, Juliana, um, thank you very much for doing this. And if you don't mind, maybe taking a moment or two to give us a little bit of your background, and then we'll jump into the slide. Hi, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I'm Juliana Whitney uh, with Can Strategy and have been doing cannabis business strategy consulting for six or seven years now, essentially, you know, consulting is a term that so many people use and it means so many different things <laughs> with every individual or every company you work with. Uh, so with can strategy, it's always based around, you know, finding our clients goals, finding someone's goals, and then figuring out the pieces to put together to get there. If it's winning licenses or, you know, launching a company, scaling a company, whatever that may be, it's my favorite thing because I went to business school specifically for new venture development. I thrive on this whole, all the, you know, hemp, cannabis, all these brand new businesses and figuring out how to help people win. And so it's just my jam, you know? <laughs> awesome. And awesome. So um, Brad's put some resources from from Cannabis News Hub on the side of the slide that kind of will touch on 
the topics that I'm going to go over today, uh, which include planning to compete instead of just, is my, hold on, is my computer shaking? <laughs> planning to compete instead of just making a product and working with SOPs and then corporate social responsibility. I'm also going to touch on how um, hiring and training kind of ties into those. And each of these topics seems, they can one seem very evident that these things have to do with the success of a company. However, because they're simple, uh, a lot of people think that they get it, but very few people implement these things properly and therefore don't actually benefit from the potential success support that these items have for a business. I will start with your planning to compete, <laughs> not just make a product. So as I've worked with companies over the past few years, there's consistently a few similarities in either mistakes that are made or misconceptions that people have. And one of those is that being in such a cool uh, space, let's say hemp, CBD, like all this opportunity, everyone's very into it right now. Um, Canvas has that similar vibe that companies will start and think that, okay, I'm going to make this product that people really want. And so it will just sell itself. And that's not true. <laughs> and it causes a lot of issues uh, because if you just see pr your product sitting in your inventory, you can't sell it. It comes becomes like such a hustle and uh, ultimately, if that continues, then the business will not survive, which is an unfortunate event, which means actually planning to compete and understanding that, yes, this may be a product that people want, but you still have to sell the product to them. You still have to network. You, you're still operating a business that needs to have all of the business support and business growth things that businesses generally need, which is one thing I always say, I'm like, uh, we're still running a company here because <laughs> people kind of get um, almost like throwing things together so hopeful, but forget those core business pieces. So planning to compete, what does that look like? One, obviously you get a great product. You're great at your process. You come up with a great product. But if you have gold sitting in a room and no one knows it's there, it doesn't matter that you have gold. So you have to get it to the world. And that will have to do with really investing in awesome web development, not, not just making something, you know, on Webflow or, <laughs> or whatever platform. Uh, really focus on the user experience for your website and Pay attention, make sure your designer knows a lot about bounce rates and things like that. How do you get a customer to stick? And so this is if you have a consumer facing product. Um, then your branding, don't just develop a brand in Canva or you know on Fiverr. Put some real thought into wh who your target is, what, what you want the whole thing to look like, your packaging, um, everything, make it intentional. Just like if you go to Whole Foods and they each have their products, it is very simple and it makes a lot of sense, but the intentionality behind it is frequently missing. And, you know, logos will just be thrown together kind of, oh, we've got a brand and that's not really what having a brand is. So I would suggest having someone very specifically focus on developing that. And then um, actually getting out there and marketing, doing a, a review of your competitors, your competitor analysis. What are you up against? What are your differentiators? How do you communicate those to the world? Uh, and this ties into even if you create a source product. So even if you don't have a customer or a consumer facing product and you do business to business and provide source material, you still have to, for anyone sourcing that material, <laughs> Find ways to differentiate yourself from everyone else that's offering something that is seemingly the same. How do you communicate that it's different? How do you build those relationships? How do you maintain those over time? And avoid getting just strictly into a price war 
because that is a rough, a rough way to operate if you only differentiate based on the price of your product. Um, so Juliana, order, Juliana then, I'm sorry, this is Brad. I just want to jump in real quick and ask a really quick question. It's a please. thought that kind of occurred to me. Um, what percentage would you say of companies that you talk to come to you at the ver very beginning of the process and allow you to help put these strategies in place versus companies that get started and are further down the road and then have yeah. to backtrack because they haven't done these things? Okay, that's a great question. <laughs> uh, at the beginning... Some come, it's actually very few who really realize that they need to do all of these things. And they're usually resistant because it's an investment. It's an investment of capital to develop these pieces of your business. However, uh, what I saw happen was, let's say six years ago in the Vegas market, I was saying these things, you've got to develop these things. You've got to have something that differentiates you. Everyone's mindset was, oh no, it'll just sell itself. You know, we're growing cannabis, people want it, it'll sell itself. Cut to six years later and everyone is struggling to sell their products. Any cultivator I run into, any processor I run into, the most stressed individuals I've ever met because they are just like dying to sell this product and they can't do it uh, because they did not develop true brands with true brand identities, really market. The consumer does not know who they are. They don't know why to buy your product over another one. Um, and so then these businesses wind up at a point where, okay, well, now we have to figure out how to compete when for six years they could have been doing that. And now they're kind of at square one again. And it's a lot harder to develop those things when you're already in the middle of operating and to kind of backtrack. Absolutely. And, and, and the other immediate question that pops up to me that I'm sure people will ask about, um, maybe yeah. I'll save them the trouble, is, is there much of a difference ultimately between consumer facing companies and the things that they need to do to prepare their brand and um, essentially plan to compete uh, versus a, a, a business to business oriented company? Um, or, or are those processes still very similar? They're similar, but there is a difference because the consumer facing products really have to have a very specific brand voice and be highly focused on your core consumer and what their personality is, what the model of that human being is and who you're speaking to consistently speak to them. So be, how do I consistently reach these people, keep them engaged, all of that stuff. Whereas when you're a business to business, let's say providing source material, you have to build those relationships. You need somewhat of a brand. It's more about your reputation uh, generally as a company and your people's willingness to work with you is more based on okay, how, how easy is it to work with this company? Do they, you know, are their timelines done well? That kind of thing and building that reputation. But let's say like social media and advertising, you don't have to focus on as much. And it's good to have a nice website to interact with, but you don't necessarily have to be like the most cutting edge <laughs> right. as you do when you're dealing with mass consumers. You Got know? It. Yeah. And, uh, do you have any other questions? No, I'm, I'm good. Sorry, okay. I just you. I thought, I, thought, I thought that would be a good thing to cover initially, but thank you. Yes, definitely. Um, yeah, so basically just creating a strategy, like Brad said, there's a difference. If you, if you start from the very beginning, <laughs> then you have uh, so much more creative freedom and, you know, you're starting from scratch with it. You can be very intentional, put it together, and then you move forward mindfully with your company and you're really free to grow and build and scale from that point. And your branding, your website, all of that stuff is always in development, but you'll simply be tweaking it versus if you don't pay attention to that stuff. Years later, you realize, ah, I can't sell these things. 
how do how do I sell these things? How do I compete? And then you try to develop them and then you try to market them. That's a much heavier lift. And I promise you would be feeling like, man, I just wish I did this at the beginning. The, the upfront investment won't seem like it was all that much at that point. Um, yeah, so that's basically your planning to compete, not just to make a product, though obviously making a great product is still very important. And part of that is your standard operating procedures, which I'm really big on because we, at CAN, we do a lot of uh, competitive licensing and we do startup operations, which means we have to have their standard operating procedures really on point. And through that, there's a few things I've realized <laughs> is that with different companies I work with, I will say the word standard operating procedure. They're like, you, oh, do you have your SOPs? You know, we all throw that word around. And everyone says yes. But the version of SOPs I've seen from every different company, totally different. There's like such a scale. Some will have one page that's basically bullet point steps. And then some are like novels. <laughs> Here's how you do every single thing in the world. And I'm actually a fan of both. I would recommend having both of those models. One is with your SOPs, having the fully written out, very highly detailed, just novel for, you know, your security, your cultivation, your harvest, your post-harvest, your waste management, all the things. Totally written out, totally state compliant, have all of your state regulations in there. And that is specifically so, yes, you as a business know how you operate, what your standards are. The state knows that you are aware of what all of the rules are. Uh, and also, let's say down the road, if you happen to have a goal of being acquired, having documents that are solid like that are really helpful in, uh, in an acquisition because it helps the purchaser know that, oh, this business really has all their stuff together and it makes it easy, uh, easy to buy, <laughs> buy you basically. <laughs> uh, then the simpler versions I'm a big fan of because what I've seen is companies will utilize their large SOPs and attempt to train employees using those large SOPs. And it's not highly effective because it's arduous. Uh, it's like trying to put an employee back in school and asking them to read a textbook and fully comprehend what's going on. So breaking the SOPs down into bite sizes and into things that are more digestible gives you a better chance at correctly training your people and therefore having an operation that actually does follow what your standard operating procedures are because your employees aren't so confused. Plus they have a very simple resource to go to rather than feeling like they're having their like go to some giant textbook every time they're not sure what to do. Uh, so I'm a big fan of having both of those. And over time, and this is something that requires consistency, but and so an investment of time, and it's a reason a lot of people won't do it, but it's definitely worth doing is let's say once a year, you set aside a week where you make sure that your SOPs are updated because your processes may have changed, um, your policies may have changed, regulations may have changed, and you wanna make sure those just keep, keep updated pretty simply so, <laughs> so everything's always in order and you don't have to do things like backtrack or, or worry if, I don't know, someone wants to review your documentation, you're solid, you're solid. <laughs> and um, that kind of ties into then you're hiring and training. Um, and this has to do with your, you know, competing and stuff like that. It is helpful to compete. It's helpful if you have employees who stay with you. <laughs> and it's helpful if you have employees who really do know what they're doing, um, which means that in planning to compete, a piece of the process that has been oversimplified, which is a hiring process and a training process is so key to the development of your business 
nothing can hold you back quite like a high turnover rate. <laughs> you will constantly have employees that are new, brand new and being trained. Your systems get slowed down, processes get slowed down. If you can manage to have a low turnover rate and maintain your people, then everything keeps building. The skills keep building, the experience keeps building, the understanding of the company culture, everything keeps getting better, but you have to be able to keep your people. And in order to do that, yes, that has to do one like with leadership once they're there, but it also has to do with how you find your employees and how you select them. So a lot of uh, people have oversimplified what hiring is and will just get a bunch of employees in and or potential candidates in, look at their resumes, who has the skills, who has stayed at places at least two years, let's say, and then that's basically the only questions. Kind of like, okay, what are you looking for? Is the pay good or the benefits good? Okay, great, you can work here now. But you have to dive deeper <laughs> when you're first hiring people. You have to know what your company wants. Like, what do you want in culture? What do you, how does your team operate? What, what personalities do well in your environment? Um, how, you know, how many hours can someone withstand working? You don't want people who will just like very quickly feel, let's say overworked. If there's people who, um, they just thrive in different environments. And so checking on that, will they thrive in the company culture? Will they thrive in the physical work environment that's going on? Um, and just, taking temperatures on things like that, that dive deeper into who a person is before you bring them on the team will increase the likelihood that they will stick around because you've made sure that that, that will happen. Hold on, I'm gonna get water real quick. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Um, that was very quick. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, it's right here. Uh, yeah, so that will make sure that, that will happen. I preach this like crazy and it takes effort. I know almost no one loves hiring. I've not met someone who really digs the process of sifting through 300 resumes and finding the right people. But it's, you know, statistically it's been shown. I'm sure News Hub has content that can show the stats on it, but high turnover rates will decrease your profits. They can hold your company back. They'll drain your managers of, of their energy, like trying to constantly be hiring, constantly be training. And so it really does feed your company to develop a process that accurately brings in new team members. Um, and that will really, really help you thrive. And it seems simple, but because of how time intensive it is, very few companies will actually do it. So that's something I'd say like top of mind make sure it's done super well. Juliana, we do have a question from chat. Um, and that is what suggestions um, does she have for those first interview, uh, have for those first interview structure questions, ways to filter and find the right person? Okay, perfect. So I will tell you how I do this. <laughs> um, let's say you do a job posting on Indeed. At the end of it, I will say, in your response to this job posting, include the word pineapple. Because what that tells me is two things. One, they're detail-oriented. And two, they read the job post and aren't just sending out a million applications. Um, then from that point, you go through the resume as if whoever applies and like uses, let's say, the word pineapple. And then choose, select the ones that you think will be best. Then reach out to them, do your interview. In the interview, I always ask, what are your top values? Um, what, like, what, what do you value in relationships? Like what makes you feel fulfilled? What's your ideal workplace? Which, what's a culture you believe that you thrive in? Um, what kind of managers have you enjoyed working for and why was that? What were their management styles? That kind of thing uh, to get a hold on, you know, maybe they're highly skilled, but would they fit in the way that this business operates is what you're trying to like really pull out. 
That, that, that certainly sounds like the assumption that all of the potential candidates are capable of doing the job and the work. It's yeah. about culture and fit more than anything else. Exactly. And then, um, and just, yeah, kind of who they are. And then from that point, I always write up a report. And so I'll do two interviews. I'll write up a report based on that first interview. And a lot of times if you make it conversational enough and not just like a straight, you know, question, answer, question, answer, they'll come out with stuff that's interesting to know or that they care about. And I will note that at kind of like in a one page profile and break down all of their, you know, features and characteristics that work well, or if they don't just say no, <laughs> no way. Uh, and then we'll have their resume and not everyone likes doing this. I love doing this. I use a personality test. It's called 16 personalities. And I've also used DISC and the Enneagram and DISC and 16 personalities I found most useful because what they'll do is tell you so many features of who a person is, including how do they operate in a workplace? What roles do, like what do they thrive in and really enjoy stuff like that? And it's helpful for putting teams together. And it's also helpful for managing people. So if you bring someone in and you have that profile of them from 16 personalities, then you as a leader can know better how to interact with that person um, and how to better lead them and how to help them be successful. So that's a piece of it that I really love to use too. Uh, in, in the recruiting process. And then usually even after that first interview, then have a second person interview them <laughs> from the company as well. And then together uh, make a choice on who best fits the role. And those are all the pieces, which is why I say it's a little time intensive, but it's worth it to get that information and really curate you know, who you have on the team. That's awesome. Really Thank you. Yeah, of course. And then the sort of ties in, but we're kind of just going sideways over here is, well, okay. Then there's your training, which we went over a little bit with, you know, your SOPs, all the things, but make sure to train your employees and make sure you have someone designated to train them, not just on the job training, not just, Hey, you'll pick it up, which seems like, Oh yeah, they'll just pick it up. But you don't really know what they're, what they're picking up, what they're getting right, if they understand there's a process to a thing. So yes, shadowing is great, but make sure there's a real training program, step by step. I have a checklist. I've always got a checklist. Has this person been check, trained on this, 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 this? Who trained them on these things? Have a check in with them, let's say two weeks into their employment to see if there's any Thing that they are confused about, that they're not sure how to do, how to, how to approach, whatever it may be, um, and then help them figure it out from there. But what that will do to time intensive, yes, but it will give you a competent employee and a competent employee is usually a happier employee because they don't feel um, frazzled and they don't feel like they're dumb. They feel like they're contributing and people like to contribute. And yeah, that's my main training thing. Is and there any is there any kind of um, direct correlation to employees staying longer if they have gone through training? I, I know there it's such a huge cost of hiring. Yeah, um, I, I would imagine there have been studies or something done that correlates how well an employee is trained to how long they stay. Absolutely. Yeah. A well-trained employee, one, they feel like you're invested in them. And I don't have the stats for you exactly, but I'm sure news hub does. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> but I do know that they exist. So one is they feel like a company invested in them. If you train an employee, they feel like you actually cared that you employ them, that you're invested in the fact that they work for you. Um, two, they will feel more competent in being able to navigate what's going on in the world around them, which is a very simple concept, right? It's, I mean, it's a concept that every parent knows. It's how you raise a child, <laughs> but it's just something humans need. When we're, when we're operating in a system, we wanna know what part we play and how do we do that part well? 
and training helps people understand how do I do this well? How do I perform? How do I make these people I work for happy? Because we also have a need to make people around us, you know, be proud of us. And so training helps them to do that and supports employees in that. And then also just over time, it allows them to grow. So if an employee, this and this is why they would they would stay, is because if an employee is not trained up front, they will constantly be messing up and they will be struggling and struggling to get to a really good point of performance, which means they will struggle to grow with the company. They will struggle to move up or they will struggle to kind of like progress in their skill set and their ability to contribute versus if it's ensured from the very beginning that they have that base point that's set and they're sure of that, that means that it's nothing but up from there. They can just grow and grow and grow and get better and better and better and not have the tripwires of all the gaps in their learning if they hadn't been trained well. So for that reason, yes, they do stay longer because uh, they feel better. I, I would also imagine, Juliana, that there is a lot, given the status of the industry, um, where there's this intense period of growth surrounded by contraction with more growth and more contraction and the industry's growing by leaps and bounds and uh, you know the future uh, looks very, very bright. I would imagine there's a lot of poaching of employees going on where yeah. one company comes in and hires a whole crew from, from others. And yeah. perhaps, perhaps training is a way of helping them recognize their value to their original employers. Yes, I have. <laughs> I want to say um, I've seen that. And I, with Can Strategy, we do a lot of recruiting for companies. And so I have seen the companies that are the business or the employees who won't leave. They'll say, No, I'm really happy here. I really like it here. I'm doing well here. I like who I work with. I like who I work for. And I like what I'm doing. And then there are the employees who feel undervalued and are willing to jump ship as soon as possible because they're looking for a place where they like who they work with, who they work for and what they're doing. Right. Uh, so yeah, that does really matter. The training and then the leadership both together and the team building. Okay, it's like, it's a, all works together to keep the thing together. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for elaborating on that. Of course. And then... We've got, so corporate social responsibility. So this is where we're going a little left, but I told Brad, I really care about corporate social responsibility. So we're gonna touch on it. Um, and it does help your company to, it actually helps employees feel better about where they work. And it's more recently in progressing toward helping companies grow because of the mindsets of millennials and the mindsets of Gen Z who are very, you know, hyped on justice of everything. So <laughs> corporate social responsibility is, if you haven't heard of it, is essentially a corporation engaging in the community to be an actual contributor rather than just a taker from the community. So to do things like have a philanthropic giving model do things like have um, partnered nonprofit organizations that your team fundraises for or your team volunteers for all together, does something to contribute um, to the community. There's an organization called B Lab and they'll do a certified B Corp. And there's all these rules for being a certified B Corp that have to do with diversity, uh, benefits, like how you're treating your employees, your nonprofit giving, all of that kind of thing, essentially just being socially responsible. And you'll see it, it's a B and there's a circle around it. And it's on Ben and Jerry's, it's on, you know, Patagonia, Yogi T. Uh, there's so many of these benefit corporations and people don't even realize that's what they are. But the people who do realize that's what they are will buy from them because of it. <laughs> And that is starting to grow. Uh, becoming actual benefit corporation, be lab certified, or even just having those policies and those practices in your business. And you know, you don't have to shout it to the world all the time and 
be like, look what we're doing. We're so cool. We're doing cool, socially responsible things all the time, but let people know it's good for consumers. Consumers want to know if they're buying from a company that does well. And even if you're doing, um, even if you're doing more business to business work, let's say that the business you're selling to, they make a product and that product is consumer facing for them to be able to say that the company is where we source our product from, like our source material from, they're good and they're doing good things. Also, we're doing good things. That chain of good matters to the end consumer. And that's just starting to increase over time, just the way the world is now. So people will look for that and they will also stop buying from companies that are not making an attempt um, to do good. And my biggest, biggest, biggest misconception with corporate social responsibility is that it's charity. I pitched a chain of dispensaries that was uh, to get licensed and launched that would be very focused on corporate social responsibility and have a key element to it where they would donate, let's say 5% of net profits Two charities would do the volunteering, would ensure diversity, all of these things, and it would be a core tenant to the business. And one set of investors I spoke with said, it sounds like charity. And I'm not into that. We don't agree on that. That doesn't mean we won't invest, but it's I'm not into nonprofit business. <laughs> And so I had to pull the statistics, which I kind of wish I had at this moment, but um, that show that corporate social responsibility actually increases profits. It increases profits because it increases your employees' satisfaction, their engagement. Um, they're, they're wanting to stay because uh, they feel like they're contributing and like they're part of something that's important and meaningful. It increases profits because consumers will purchase from you because they believe in your business, they would even be willing to pay a little more to buy from you because they believe in the social good that you're doing. Uh, so the conception that the CSR planning is just a waste of money or you know just money out the door is not true. There's a benefit to it. It's not the reason to do it, but it's a good one. It's a good reason to do it. And Juliana, um, Scott has been kind enough in the chat to put a link for everybody um, for more information on B Corp um, oh, in the chat, which is perfect. Yeah. So th thank you, Scott, for doing that. Thank you so much. Yeah. And they actually accept, uh, I saw they have one cannabis company in there. For a while, I kept asking and they weren't really into like the whole world, but <laughs> they were like, I don't know, but they're really open to it now. So um, I actually, last year, my friend Nikki has this history of doing corporate social responsibility planning for all of the big hotels on the strip. So we brought her in. So any client who asks for it, at least we have someone who can do it for them. Uh, Cause I don't, it's a whole thing and she is skilled at it. I personally don't, don't know how to actually write those plans, uh, but it's a good thing to have. And it can really build your company culture too, which is good. And then, you know, plays into competing. It's a great competitive edge, especially, I would argue, especially in hemp and cannabis and any other industry that's pretty new, where not a lot of companies are thinking of this kind of competitive edge. They haven't invested in it. They're not, they don't even have like the brain space to worry about it, which means if you're of among the first, you're like, you're the difference between you and others is huge because you'll be of the few who've actually paid attention and done this. And that in your marketing uh, and your publicity can help you compete because you'll be a true differentiator in an industry. And for that reason is another one that I would say, it's part of success. Awesome. Um, and uh, Scott just added to the note in the chat, um, their certification is kind of pricey, but it's definitely worth it for publicly traded companies. Yes. Um, and he included the link as well. Um, so, uh, you know, we've been talking a little bit about, um, you know, things that you have found that companies 
should be doing and should be considering and should be planning and strategizing yeah. for. Um, I think everybody sadly likes to see, uh, you know, a, a terrible car, not well, they hopefully nobody gets hurt, but you know, <laughs> people gawk at car crashes. Maybe that's the way I should say it. Um, yeah. Tell us about maybe without using names, of course, or um, tell us about some of the horror stories <laughs> of companies that, that you have worked with and help sort of write the ship for companies. I think, I think it's always impressive when talking to a firm like yours in particular, and you and I have had lots of conversations, um, yeah. to hear about some of the things that you've been able to turn around for companies. I think that's a big part of what sometimes people want to hear. Okay, you got it. I can give two examples. So one is a dispensary and it's, which is not the same as let's say growing hemp, but the, the tenants are similar. So they were, they launched and they believed that because of the location that they had and the products that they sold, that they would simply be successful. And because of that, they barely trained employees. They barely paid employees because in their mind, it was an honor to work for them. Uh, they had somewhat of branding. So their building was beautiful. They invested in that kind of thing, but did not invest in their marketing. Their website was confusing. Um, and and because of the training, the employees were confusing to customers. So customers are going to employees for all the answers. Employees have no idea what they're saying. So do consumers come back? No, no way. <laughs> so um, in working with that team, we one developed marketing for them that was more targeted. So one thing companies can do is market willy-nilly without thinking like is this effective will this be effective for your business type and what you're selling so they kind of had marketing all over the place with no understanding of what was actually impactful we we brought that in and put the resources where they needed to be trained the employees uh, so that they knew how to interact with customers and could feel really intelligent and in informing customers about products um, and about the processes we changed their hiring method so that they would get more suited employees. Um, and then they really had to focus on kind of on that in-store marketing and on building those relationships with customers because their competitive market was so intense because their great location was right next to where everyone else thought would be a great location. <laughs> so there was just a bunch of them all in one spot. Right. So that's one, yeah, that's one for them. They really had to finally compete. They had to actually be different. They didn't think they would have to be, but when all the other stores have the same products, what's the difference? The difference is how people are treated when they interact with your business, how they feel when they interact with your business. Do you, are you able to keep employees? And so reducing that cost, all that kind of thing. So that's how we help them. Um, they're in Vegas. They're still going, still going strong, thankfully. Um, one actual, actual horror story though, I would tell you that, uh, <laughs> is a cultivation and processing facility and they just kind of couldn't get it together. So, but the bizarre thing, and so I've seen this is if you were to talk to them about their business, they were doing great. They were making all the right choices and decisions. But if you looked at the business, they were falling apart and just didn't want to admit that they had actually developed a logo. Their product actually looked really cool, but their ability to market it, their ability to lead was totally missing. And they, I honestly, I think they eventually wound up having to sell the business because they went into so much debt, just floundering and not being able to figure this stuff out because they didn't, they didn't figure it out from the very start. So their SOPs weren't in place. What did that mean? Failed crops because their team didn't know what to do. So they just had crops failing testing. Um, and then what did that do? Having your crops failed testing means that your brand is 
um, damaged. So then their brand was damaged. What did that mean? They had to make a whole new brand and invest in a whole new brand. Then they had to try and solve that, but they still hadn't fixed their, their hiring. So it was like this loop. Um, and honestly, you know, I love helping people, but you can't help everyone if they're not that open to it. So we did what we could, um, but ultimately they did have to sell the company they, <laughs> because it just didn't come back together. Uh, and it was kind of, it was, it was a bit of that car crash you're talking about down in flames. Right. So Juliana, a, um, a quick sort of uh, question um, came over chat and I, I know that there are no really quick um, panacea pills for, for um, clients to swallow and solve some of these issues, but ultimately when when you're talking with a organization um, about problems like that or or similar, um, how can they engage with your company to get that kind of help? What what is it that you typically look for? What what kind of conversations typically take place with my company? Yeah. So ultimately, let's say this um, this processor, they had a load of problems you just walked us through. Yes. Um, how are those problems solved? I mean, logistically, okay. um, how do how does the planning, how do you come in and help them sort of reinvent themselves and get on that right path? Um, I think I think people are very interested on the call in knowing how do you solve these issues? Um, uh, understanding them is one thing, but solving yeah. them might be totally different. It's a whole thing. Yes. Yes. Okay. So let's go like with that example or an example like that. Let's say a company is super struggling. The first thing we do is I will tell you it's a very vulnerable process because when we come in, we're going to look at everything that any business owner, they would never want anyone to see. <laughs> so we come in and well, sometimes for some business types, we'll come in and actually like watch and see what's going on um, just to see like, okay, is there anything in the process we can visually see that needs to be fixed that maybe a leader wouldn't even know what's going on? Uh, we'll ask all the questions. A lot of times we'll do, um, depending on the issue, but we'll do things like employee interviews and stuff because I find a lot of times ground floor employees have a perspective on a company that leaders have no idea this stuff is going on, but also those employees aren't speaking up. So there's this huge disconnect. So we'll figure that out. And I call all of that this like diagnostics process. And that helps to get to the root cause of a lot of pieces. From that point, um, we'll do, I'll call it an external review. Let's say it's a store or it's a product that sells to consumers. We'll do an external review and see, okay, what does your website look like? How are people interacting with it? What does your brand look like? How do you speak to the world? Is your messaging and the voice of your brand similar on every platform where they interact with you? Are you consistent? What are the reviews you get online? Figuring that stuff out, like what is it to the outside world that your brand is saying, how it's performing, all of that. And um, then figure out, you know, kind of how to heal those pieces from understanding what those problems are and say, okay, your, uh, the, your website, people get confused. People hate feeling confused. They will leave so fast. So <laughs> we'll have that redeveloped and kind of see how do we make this easier for people to understand what they're seeing, understand what they're buying. Um, your branding, if it's not a real brand, if the logo is, looks like 900 other logos and is green and black with a leaf on it, then maybe we redesign it, um, redo the logo. Your packaging, if it's not different, maybe we redesign the packaging. You can stand out with packaging. You don't all have to have the same Ziploc bags, you know? Um, <laughs> and so that's a piece. And then we'll do... Um, consumer feedback too. So if, if it's a store or if it's a product, well, actually there's these consumer experience surveys, essentially you can do to kind of gather what, how your consumer actually feels about your product, what they like, what they don't, and you can give them incentives for answering these questions. And then based on that, we'll 
really strategize, say like, okay, based on all this information, all these analytics and diagnostics, here's all these issues. And then figure out from there kind of a strategy. And, and Juliana, so once the diagnostics have been done and here are the issues, yeah. how uh, uh, Bob Moore in the chat tells a, a funny story um, <laughs> a, about he was doing uh, hotel financing back in the day. Okay. And um, he was often asked to review businesses uh, for upgrades and changes, uh, he said, uh, for finances or to sell the hotels, so forth. Uh, and so on. He said that one time he had to tell the owner that his worst employee, uh, his worst employee was his wife. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, right. So, which I find you know, hilarious. That, that that would probably be a, a very difficult conversation. <laughs> yeah. How how accepting are the owners of the firms you work with? to hearing really bad news like that. Like you, yeah. you, you need to make some gigantic fundamental changes in how you're operating. It's a hit. It's, it's a, it's definitely an, emo I think it's a emotional experience because it can feel like you're being really critical to say, here's everything going wrong. The ones who are really open to doing it all in the first place are like, okay, like, what do we have to do? Let's do it. Um, what do I have to do as a leader? That's actually funny that Bob says that about the wife, because I have found if there are family members, that conversation is hard to have go well. I had one family member, like their worst employee was their son. I mean, he would leave the doors open at night, inventories all over the place, giving product away. They wouldn't see it. They would know it's everyone else's fault. So in those cases, not the easiest conversation. Um, in other cases, it's still hard because it sucks to hear everything that's wrong with what you feel like you're doing, what you feel like is your, you know, your company. But if they really do want to succeed, they are open to it because, and especially to like, there's budget issues. Like if there's a lot of things to fix, that can get pricey. So sometimes we have to choose, okay, which key items can you invest in right now and change? Also, which ones maybe don't cost money, much money. Training your employees, again, doesn't cost that much money. It's like um, time. So I'm sorry to interject. We, we do have another question that just popped up in chat. Okay. Um, is the industry or can strategy in particular tapping into Web3 and blockchain tech? <laughs> um, I know that one of the guys at happy monkey is tapping into that can strategy specifically no my i have a lot of people around me that are involved in that stuff and i know absolutely nothing about it <laughs> so that's my response on that but i do see some people in the industry moving that direction a little bit but not a lot not a lot of people Guardi, is there um, is there something specifically that you're looking for? Um, and keep keep this in mind. In a moment, and you know what, it's actually a good time for me to do this. Um, let me make sure that everybody knows how they can reach both myself and Juliana. Um, you know, if you have direct questions like that, or you want to go into more detail, um, you're always welcome to email or reach out to me. Um, but if you would like to reach out to Juliana as well, um, whether it be to ask questions uh, like that or find out more specifics or perhaps to even engage with her uh, with your company, um, here is uh, her information to do so. Um, I will be following up with everybody just to make sure that if any more questions pop up, uh, we get them answered for you. Beautiful. Okay. Um, so I know we're kind of close to the end of our session. Um, I do want to see if there are any other questions uh, that pop up in the chat that we could possibly answer. Um, let's see. Um, so I think we just got a little note. Uh, thank you. Um, Juliana, lots of nice comments coming in to me and to the group. Um, Dr. Hall wrote, uh, Gold Standard Partners has decentralized blockchain banking technology 
and uh, includes a website for you to go to. So if you want to go to the chat, you can see that sign. Um, some people are starting to use blockchain for smart contracts. Very interesting. Very cool. Yeah. yeah to track the contracts. That makes sense. Um, so I, I actually have a question for um, Mandy. I don't, Mandy, if you're still there. Um, yeah. Have you had blockchain experts come on and speak to the group? We have. We've done a couple. Okay. Yeah, I'm wondering where all the blockchain questions are coming from. So, um, I, well, I, I know I know a few folks in the industry as well. So I thought if maybe it would be a good time to bring somebody else in. I think it would. Well, and it comes up a lot, especially around carbon trading, right? And adding the smart contracts and track and trace. And right. Something that comes up, and it's it's funny when you get you know people that are in traditional banking and traditional agriculture. Yes. Um, you know, to say, wait, like blockchain is actually a solution that we can lean into now. And so it's been an interesting uh, bridge of that gap, being able to talk about it on an agriculture perspective and business perspective at the same time. Well, just like Juliana, I am going to admit my complete naivete. I know nothing <laughs> really about blockchain at all. Um, and anything that I say, I'm frankly reading off of a website or a cheat sheet somewhere. So I'll, I'll admit that up front. Um, I have a question. Yeah, as, please. as you're consulting, um, I have a question on what are the main things that you're seeing as business practices of management that are turning employment away or increasing turnover rates? Yeah, speaking on the management side, you know, a lot of people that are on here are business owners. What are we doing that we need to be focusing on or paying attention to? That's a great question. Uh, I would say one thing is kind, well, and I have a feeling none of you do this, but I've seen it in the industry a lot. Is, say. <laughs> <laughs> but acting like, the employees are privileged to be there um, and acting like in some way, like they owe a great gratitude to you as an employer. It's great if they are uh, grateful for being there, but acting like, you know, you're someone's savior and, um, you know, if not for them, how would they, <laughs> how, not for you, how would they possibly provide for their family, you know? So that's kind of one thing I've seen a lot that people don't respond well to. Scheduling, um, having really inconsistent schedules. And then that, that literally takes people's ability to control their own life out of their hands. If they don't know their timing and they can't plan things ahead of time, uh, that will make people leave a lot. And then just really kind of disconnected management that you know doesn't engage doesn't get to know people and um so people feel really disconnected and then also just not led in a very good way and checking in over time i think a lot of times management will create great relationships up front but not continue to you know check in invest in those and they don't just grow on their own it'll kind of die out mm -hmm. uh, but those are some things. The scheduling thing I would say is so huge because when I see that, it's just like really, that's really hard on, on employees for sure. Cause it does take something really important away, which is an ability to control your own time in life, you know? Cool. 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 Okay. Well, of course I'm curious because I'm really passionate about building a team and taking care yeah. of it. And, and, you know, it's so much of what you said carries over to our membership and an association and the relationship building. And so, yeah, yeah. exactly. I just, just curious. Does anybody else have any questions last minute? Go ahead, Jane. Maybe you're on mute. I miss saying that you're on mute, Jane. <laughs> you're on mute. Aha, uh -huh. you got it, girl. Maybe. My back? You're, yeah. you're back. I Yay. hear you. Okay, nice to see you all. That's wonderful. Hi. 
I have a question. I, I've started five companies and I'm about to do a raise. But one thing that I did as a company owner throughout my life, 32 years of doing that, I welcomed people. They ended up yes. being part of my family and in every business. I'm still in communication with them. I've been gone since 2009. So what I want to say is, I don't know if I recommend that in um, in an industrial, mine were different kinds of businesses and um, they weren't socially involved. This is industrial. I'm asking that question, I guess, a roundabout way. I do like making people feel like they're a part of the business. I'm, I'm starting an industrial plant and um, it's a major, a major um, plant with a hundred foot device that's going to process plant uh, the plant. So there are technical reasons why somebody should be um, informed how to operate it and how it runs and how it's supposed to run. But I also want to look at it like, okay, you have this job and I don't want people to get job burnout. Okay, you're only doing this particular thing. So I thought I would ask, well, what time of day should we start, folks? We, I talk in we and I welcome them in to have input. Is that a mistake in a factory or plant position or am I being too nice? Because I've been accused of being too nice. So I just, that's my question. Um, is there anything wrong with giving them some input to how the, how they're, how it'll work for them? I think it's good to give some input. Things like what time of day do we start? That I believe there should just kind of be a structure in place. So yep. there's a balance between create the boundary and understanding that you, you know, this business is a business, you're leading this thing, there's a structure to it. Mm -hmm. And then with some other pieces, maybe their, their input is at least welcome, but also mm -hmm. make sure it's understood that while your input is welcome, it may not be taken, but that's, you know, not a personal thing, but you do want to make sure that you're, you're gathering that input. Also, if you do take input, you do have to sometimes be, you know, you don't always have to implement it, but from time to time you do, or else eventually they're going to think you're totally full of it yep. <laughs> when you ask for input. Um, but yeah, oh, I, I'm, I'm an implementer for the most part. Yeah. <laughs> I'm doing beyond what's required by law to provide a safe environment. That, yeah. And um, I, there's different job titles and different job performances required. And I thought about job share where, so that you don't have somebody that's eight hours a day doing the same thing. Maybe they'd move. So everyone actually would understand how to operate that different job thing. So in case someone's sick or we're shorthanded somewhere, everyone would know. And that's how I actually did run uh, my businesses, but not in a factory situation. And I didn't know if that was, I, I don't like doing the same thing eight hours a day. I personally right. don't. Yeah. I've never operated, uh, I've never actually worked in one of those positions, oh. but on a theoretical level, <laughs> I do know that, um, what was it? I think it was some, it was like Karl Marx or something, but essentially yep. said workers yes. really alienated from their final product. So having people be able to engage in the process along the way, that may actually increase their feeling of involvement That's in, what in what they're doing. Thank you, Juliana. I've appreciated listening to you. I, Thank you. I have been retired, as I said, a long, a while, and I might not um, have been exposed yet to some of the new uh, ways of dealing with employees and they matter to me. I'd be spending a lot of my life with them too. And um, I want it to be a positive experience for everyone. So I visualize that, but I'm a forever optimist. So I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jane, Jane, I want to, I want to go to work for you, Jane. <laughs> well, Brad, I have, consider it. You, all. you have a lot to offer. <laughs> oh, I love that. Thank you. All right. Thank you. We've had our love fest now. I took down your numbers <laughs> and your emails and I do, uh, I will contact you if I need you. I want to remind Mandy 
of when I came here one other time, what a resource this was for me. I don't always get to come because I'm working so hard. I have 12 meetings last week, but I think every time I get my text message, Mandy, my heart is pulled. Um, <laughs> uh, two people that were here, we went down in little clusters of groups yeah. and they helped me get an auditor. I was looking for six months during the pandemic. Many of them gave up that license because things were slowing down and they, they had to attend school and so on and so forth. So that was a huge deal for me. I was able to move forward and I will be doing my race sometime in the next month. That's a huge deal for me. Thank you. And, um, that makes yeah. my heart sing knowing that well, you are people need to yeah. know Mandy. There's a, there's a wonderful value here. Thank you. And um, I love that breaking down thing too. And I, I probably missed lots of other ones, but that was the one I needed to be at. It was Fred McMurray from Oregon. Yeah. He sent me to someone in Pennsylvania <laughs> who gave up for a while, and then he contacted me, and he got me a guy in Utah. I'm in oh. Utah, folks. So <laughs> I, Guess I where have I'm a at. Manage, yeah, I have a management company in California. My portal is here, and by the way, he's an expert on Bitcoin, and he teaches at local universities here. And... Um, he he was in high demand before the um, pandemic hit, and that that company is greatly expanding. He's um, my, around my age group, and a very responsible man. Um, I'm very proud of what he's doing to help people fund things. So when I get done through all of this, I want to share with you how it happened, so you will be able to see that you have potential. I don't agree with the stock market. It's as far as I'm concerned, it's manipulated. I also hired the first, the lawyer that created the new form of shares and I'm raising in C, C, F, and D. So I have this opportunity that in my lifetime, I never had before. So I, I'm, I think it's very important that we all find out how that is done. And I've had hurdles and hurdles and I don't want to see anyone else go through what I went through. So I'm hooking Thank up you. the, I'm, you're welcome. I'm hooking up the auditor with this portal. Yep. So they have a licensed auditor to refer to now. They didn't, they for a long, it, I mean, it was just terrible. And then um, other people that have been helpful to me, digital Thank niche you. agency is a marketing share agency. I'm working with them and they've been so helpful. They love my project. So they're not charging a commission. It's, it's Thank amazing. You. Some of the things. So anyway, I probably have, lab long enough so, and, <laughs> there's you know. one other question i want to get to i actually really appreciate your yes testimony yeah, thank and you. thank you very much for talking thank about you. it it's really what the reason we put this together right and really yep. the value to the membership and yep. being able to take education and brad thank you very much for bringing juliana really appreciate it um i saw grady has a question i don't know if grady are you still there yeah. yes it's uh Gardy, um but thank you uh, I um, personally, oh, what's going on with the camera? I'm sorry. One second. <laughs> uh, uh, saying I'm unable to do it. All right, never mind. Well, um, me personally, I asked the question about the blockchain um, before. Mm -hmm. I'm currently a college student uh, here on my last um, my last semester for uh, bit in business uh, administration. And one of the, uh, the first company pretty much that uh, on my journey, entrepreneurial journey, would be a uh, hemp processing plant, uh, which I've been kind of uh, tweaking the idea for about like five years, because at first it was pretty abstract in 2015. So like now the technology and stuff like that is actually more plausible for it to actually happen. And um, blockchain technology would pretty much allow it to uh, happen. Mm -hmm. So for me, uh currently writing down like you know the business plan sops and whatnot um how would i um can you in a sense give me some checkpoints i guess for me to kind of uh go through and make sure i have that or uh just yeah anything any ideas i guess to teach me in the right, go in the right direction for starting out writing your sops um yes okay uh man we just launched this thing called leafsheets.com. And if we'd built out the hemp part of it, I would send you there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, right now it's just cannabis. Well, um, I'm actually in the, uh, well, I've been tapped in with a Leafly learning program to tap in on the cannabis side, uh, which I'm actually going on a cannabis tour um, 
at the end of April um, okay. for uh, uh, in Oklahoma to get licensed in and deal with stuff over there. Uh, just really entrance into the uh, just the industry all, uh, overall because I live in Florida personally and it's pretty tough as far as um, the laws goes over here. So we have to kind of just outsource until it uh, moves forward a lot more over here. Okay. There's some key things I would say to at least get started with your mm -hmm. SOPs. One is go on um, any state website where they kind of list what your required pieces are, which are usually your security plan and stuff like that. So you know the plans you need to write. Okay. Two, pull the regulations for wherever you're going to operate and uh, mm -hmm. read them, which regulations are not fun to read, but <laughs> you need to yes, read I've them. Yes, I've already been coming through the hemp cultivation <laughs> by the I already know. Good. And then as you do that, I would say separate out the different pieces of regulations into their topic. So if, you know, into their topic of, oh, this belongs with waste management, this belongs with this SOP, just piece them out. Then you kind of know what, you know, you need to integrate into them. Then okay. one thing I did when I very first started is I Googled standard operating procedures. I specifically looked up standard operating <laughs> procedures for pharmaceutical companies because I figured that they would have very intense, crazy standard operating <laughs> procedures. Uh, of course, being in the health industry. Yeah. So if you look up something like that from a very intense industry, they will have what I would the SOPs I was talking about, which are just like highly involved, highly detailed. So you can get a concept of what you, what uh, SOP needs to look like, what kind of detail it needs to go into. Mm -hmm. Then on a conceptual base, you'll kind of have it all together. Um, from that point, all I remember is I kind of just figured it out. I'm not sure exactly how to tell you to figure it out. Yeah. You just like attempt to model um, for your business type and for your regulations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for that, right, well, I've been diving into uh, this Web3 space for like a couple months now. I'm actually um, uh, registered for Wharton Business, or school, um, Wharton Business School for the to get the certification over there uh, in fintech. Um, so uh, to try to bring it into uh, this industry um, overall. So with um, NFTs and just crypto, period, it gives... Um, a wide range of like, uh, it gives, how can I say it? Uh, it makes the business model a lot more customizable, if that makes sense. Okay. So the, the, the traditional business models that we would see today, like uh, you can pretty much add everything that you were talking about uh, before, all wrapped up in kind of one little NFT if you kind of own this, if that makes sense. Okay. So it, it's kind of like, how do I write that down in an in uh, in, in SOP, if that makes sense? Like. Mm. Uh, yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, see? So, all right. So, I, I understand. I'm like, right. <laughs> for, an, for an example, right? Um, just for a smaller uh, a business, just to give a, uh, an example. Uh, if a dispensary, for an example, wanted to issue uh, NFTs that would allow them to get uh, a certain, or on the business side, because um, I wanted to give to dispensaries. So, for a, a grower to be giving to dispensaries, for an example, they will issue okay. out NFTs that that dispensary would have to get a certain amount um, or for a certain price or whatever contract that they have with that business, period. Mm -hmm. Whatever mm -hmm. crown checks can be wrapped in that, in that NFT itself. That's what smart contracts are and mm -hmm. would allow the internet of things of the product be mm -hmm. documented down the line for so it can kind of see all that aspects of it. You get what I'm saying? Yes. Uh -huh. So, so are you uh, asking how to write an SOP for that? Yeah, because it's so fairly new, if that makes oh. sense. Okay, so the it's just an operating procedure when you're writing okay. it down, right? So okay. what you would do is think through literally every single step to making this happen. How mm -hmm. is that NFT created? Then what is it used for? Then how is how does it interact with the, uh, let's say the cultivation and the dispensary? How mm -hmm. does the cultivation get it to the dispensary? Um, if it were the dispensary, they would need to write how they receive it from a cultivation. Are there any security measures? Are there any networking things that need to be done? Um, data security, anything like that? Then you okay. need to write about all of that what is all of the data security that you'll have in place to make sure this thing is safe? Um, mm -hmm. How is it transferred? Where are the rules around it? Who can see it? Who can't see it? How do you access it? Write down all of that 
So you just really like type out every single step to the thing um, okay. until it gets to whoever it's going to. And it would be out of your business's hands at that point, because on their end, they'll have an SOP for the rest of it, for the receiving okay. and then the utilization. Okay. All does right. that make sense? No, it really does. It really does. Um, so, all right. Yeah, that'll be it. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? And Brad, do you have anything you want to say before we close up? Um, no, I just, I'm very grateful again for the audience and especially to Juliana for joining and, um, and sharing some of her wisdom and experience. And uh, I would encourage anyone who has more questions to reach out to myself or to Juliana and let us let us help. Awesome. And, and as always, thank you, Mandy. <laughs> well, thanks. You guys. Thank you, Mandy. <laughs> Absolutely. So we'll keep doing these every Wednesday. Today, like I said, was a little bit tricky, but um, this will be published and shared on our YouTube channel. And just a reminder, starting in April, we're going to skim back on some of our events and we're going to start hosting member events that are a little bit more exclusive or their member benefit, right? But it's an exclusive for members, but we're going to be bringing some different uh, topics and um more in-depth discussions, some technical discussions, some you know contract discussions, some opportunities to hear from big brands about what we need in order to bridge these gaps and hopefully then create supply chain and distribution and things like that. So keep that in mind. Um, other than that, if you guys need anything, don't hesitate to re reach out to Joanne or Kayla or I. Um, we would love to have you at NoCo. Just a reminder, I don't know if you're going to be there. Brad, you're not going to be there, you said, but what about you? Yeah. Juliana, are you going to be there? Oh, no, I won't be there either. <laughs> okay, well, I hope to see you guys. Um, yeah. It is. I would love to meet up and we'll have to connect sometime. Brad, I'll turn it over to say anything else. Yeah, no, again, thank you all. I hope everyone continues to, to be ha happy and healthy. Stay safe out there. And um, if you are traveling, be careful. Uh, and um, if, again, if there's anything that I can help you with, I look forward to that opportunity. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thank okay. You. Everyone See have you. a terrific rest of the day. Next month. Have a good day. Bye everybody.